Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vago Maradian here in Tampa, Florida, where we've been covering the National Defense Industrial Association's annual SOFIC Conference and Trade Show, one of the world's leading gatherings of special operators and the companies that serve them from around the world. Our coverage here is sponsored by FLIR, and uh, we are here with uh, Colonel Melissa Johnson of the U.S. Uh, Air Force, uh, who is the Special Operations, uh, U.S. Special Operations Command's Program Executive Officer for Fixed Wing Aviation. Fortunately, that's that's not a mouthful. Uh, thank you so much for uh, taking some time at the end of a very long, very busy conference, particularly for you. Uh, this is our final interview here. Unfortunately, we've had a terrific time. Uh, and I wanted to have get the opportunity because your portfolio has some of the more complex systems that the command is developing. Uh, granted, you're doing that in partnership with a number of the other services, particularly the United States Air Force, which is the executive agent for the, some of the aircraft that you're modifying and putting into service, uh, but you also work with the Army and the Navy and other, mm -hmm. the other services and even Space Command as well. Uh, but talk to us on what the priority mission areas are, or rather, the systems in each of the priority mission areas, because you cover strike, transport, uh, ISR. Talk to us about sort of the, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, what each of the most important programs are uh, in, in the portfolio. Great. Thago, first of all, thanks for, thanks for uh, interviewing me. Um, great to be here. Um, as you said, we do have three kind of major lines of effort in priority sets. Uh, first is strike aircraft. So that includes the AC-130W, so the Whiskey model that's been in operations for about 10 years now. Uh, AC-130J, the recapitalization of the gunships. And uh, we have small munitions, uh, we call it our SOPIGM Special Ops uh, Precision Guided Munitions Programs. So that's the first line of effort. Second line of effort is the mobility, so all our transport, the infill, exfill of Special Operations Forces, refueling capability for some of the other air vehicles. That is really the other part of the C-130 fleet, so MC-130J, which we are recapitalizing, and then CV-22, and then we just kind of keep obsolescence um, kind of work with our legacy aircraft for the obsolescence on some of the older portions of the C-130 fleet. And then finally, the ISR uh, portfolio, and that is really everything from small unmanned vehicles, everything from quadcopters, group one, those are things that might have only five pounds of payload, very lightweight, all the way up to MQ-9s from an unmanned perspective, and then through manned ISR aircraft. So those are some of the commercially derivative aircraft that we modify with special operations gear to uh, provide battle space awareness and ISR for our, our forces. And uh, obviously that would be the C-12, for example, would be one of one of the aircraft in that portfolio. Um, talk to us a little bit about the AC-130 uh, and also the uh, MC-130 and what's happening there. Uh, those aircraft have been in the inventory for a very long time. C-130, I think, is, what, 1955 or so when its original iteration. Uh, Lockheed working with customers around the world, but particularly U.S. Air Force has been working to always ad evolve and adapt the airplane. The J came on as sort of a commercial development program that then uh, was, uh, was has become sort of the foundational version of the airplane with better power and better capability. Talk to us about the step change that's going to happen when you go from the older airframe to the C-130J for both the uh, gunship mission but as well as the MC mission. Absolutely. So, yeah, starting with the strike mission. So, again, AC-130W has been out in the field for about 10 years now, so a lot of modifications happened back in kind of 2008 time frame. We just finished about a year ago when uh, General Webb from AFSOC declared IOC for the gunships, and really what that does is it Im improves our, our standoff range. It, we have better sensors. We have uh, better gun stations for the operators so that are working inside the aircraft, communications between the operators or crew members on the air vehicle. Um, and that just provides a, just a more effective capability for those downrange. Also, we're able to integrate our small precision guided munitions on that aircraft uh, for downrange ops. Um, so that's probably the, the biggest change there. On the MC side, on the mobility side, we're doing a lot of airborne mission networking. So if we want to be able to talk only between crew members on the front of the aircraft to um, those who are operating any sensor technology, um, going to making sure that that is effective, efficient, and reduce the crew work workload as much as possible. Also being able to fuse a lot of data, and I would say that's where a lot of our technology and integration comes from, is making sure we're having very effective data fusion for the future so commanders can have um, decision quality information as quick as possible. The command is in a form of tra is in an era of, of transformation. Mm -hmm. um, it has to continue executing the missions it's been doing against a whole bunch of bad 
folks, whether in Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, elsewhere in the world, while also readjusting for peer competition. Um, that was a mission that the Special Operations Command has always had, mm -hmm. but hasn't been as focused on, but now is reinvigorated when you look at adversaries like China and potential adversaries like China, Russia, and certainly North Korea with its big Special Operations Force. Talk to us some of about how you're ensuring that the platforms that you're helping develop are being developed with an eye toward the kind of denied uh, airspace operations that they may have to do in the future. The Air Force used to use the AC uh, gun, the class of gunship, whether the 47 or the 119 or the 123, and then eventually the C-130 in Vietnam, you know, under fire in contested airspace. Talk to us a little bit about how you're developing your systems with an eye to be able to accomplish everything that they're able to do now in permissive airspace, but also be able to deliver in a denied area, a denied environment, or a contested environment. No, that's a great question. That has been a huge focus. As you said, you know, we're still in this counterterrorism BEO fight, and we don't think that that's going to go away anytime soon. So how do we prepare for that next fight? And I'd say the biggest area where we're focusing on is survivability. So how can I take a legacy aircraft and make that viable? It's really through electronic warfare means. How do I put on those right systems so I can be able to avoid or at least be ahead of that threat as I go into that contested environment? And we're looking at options and integrating on both the ACs and the MCJ so we keep that relevant for the long term. Um, in addition, when we talk about networking, airborne mission networking is another technology where we wouldn't think that that's so much survivability, but the quicker that a crew can make a decision gives them that advantage over their adversary. And from a sustainability standpoint, um, the, these are smaller fleets, and anytime there's a smaller fleet, there's a challenge. And at a time when f faster cycles and this sort of buy whatever fits minor modification, that can also leave you with a whole bunch of stuff that you have been acquired quickly, but don't but then present certain sustainability challenges. Talk to us about how you're working this fine balance, given that, that your, your platforms are going to be around for decades. You want to be able to refresh subsystems, but you also don't want to have, you know, squ square pegs being jammed into round holes at the end of the day and, and then find out that the peg isn't even made, you know, in a couple of years because commercial industry has moved on because the commercial cycles are extraordinarily fast. Right. No, absolutely. And that is a continual challenge that we're working. I think one of the major challenges that we're working through are, I say, initiatives that that we're working through is having a more modular open missions, open architecture approach. So if we look at what is the one thing that continually outpaces us, it's software and all the hardware and firmware that goes along with it. So the more open architecture we can get, common interfaces between our industry partners as we integrate multiple payloads on whatever system it is, not just on the gunships or on the MCJs, but any of the aircraft, then the more viable and sustainable and reliable that that aircraft will be for the longer term. Um, uh, how do you get, you know, the whole focus of, you know, whether you're talking to uh, Jim Smith, you're talking to General Thomas, or anybody else in the organization, you know, the focus, you know, out the folks, good folks at AFWorks, mm -hmm. everything is about how to increase velocity. You know, let's do everything faster. Uh, the changes that are being done at a big uh, acquisition and technology from uh, level at the Pentagon is, uh, you know, we heard from Ellen Lord, the Undersecretary for Acquisition and Sustainment, about how to accelerate cycle, focus on reducing sustainment costs. She's reorganizing her whole uh, organization. Uh, talk to us about, from your standpoint, what are the keys to get faster, to cut cost, but also make sure that you're always delivering something that's not going to, A, cause you, you know, that the operator downstream is, is going to be very happy with, but also then doesn't cost downstream cost, which is, which is a kind of a complicated challenge if you think about it. No, absolutely. And that falls right in line with what I told industry this week at Sofic, which is really a great opportunity for us to understand what's going on, what un incoming technologies and ways of doing business. So if we were going to increase our velocity to the field and kind of and get ahead and have that competitive advantage, we need to prototype and try out something before we do that full on buy. That's really been a part of our culture. Mr. Smith and General Thomas have talked about that, but if we try things out quickly, we can have that iteration speed much quicker. Along with that, I talked about the adaptability before. Being able to be adaptable, open systems, a common architecture, or at least a common interface to an architecture, allows us, to, it's, it's a great enabler to that pivot speed. And then and that also enables us to make those changes quickly, and again, it goes back to that um, 
maintainability, survivability, sustainability piece of it. And you mentioned AFWorks, other things like that. We have great partnerships both with our own SoftWorks here in Tampa and out through the services, other um, DIUX, other organizations that do a lot of this rapid prototyping. And two last quick questions because I know we're going to get the hook and I'm, I'm the only thing standing uh, between you and getting back to the office yeah. to do some more work, alas. Uh, but um, you, from an unmanned system standpoint, um, one of the big focuses obviously is counter UAS, counter unmanned systems. Uh, a lot of great unmanned systems on display but also a lot of technology out there. And if we're developing these counter UAS systems, then so are our potential adversaries. How, you know, and since the unmanned portfolio is in your account, what are the challenges that that presents? Because you want to be able to, you know, be able to defeat somebody who's coming at you with systems that you want to stop. At the same time, you want to make sure that your systems aren't going to be stopped by the other guy, Absolutely. you know, short of some very direct kinetic means. And even then, you're yeah. thinking about creative ways to solve that problem. Talk to us about the yin and yang of this kind of complicated problem that you're wrestling with. Yeah, absolutely. So I think there's kind of two major focuses. One, assured communications. So we know that there's always going to be challenges as you have a lot of things going on in the battle space. How do I ensure that from a command and control perspective, who's ever operating our systems can be able to send that those proper signals and it sends and receives as required. The other area is how do I have standoff? So again, if I'm going to go back to a survivability aspect to it, no matter what my environment is, whether it's permissive or a more contested area, if I can reduce my size, weight, and power of my capabilities and push it into smaller unmanned vehicles from the more manned and, and group, I'd say your Reaper and Predator size into the smaller UAVs, then I can get some standoff and again, provide, the, provide ground force commanders that same capability, but in a much more survivable way. Um, from an acquisition perspective. And what are the things you want from industry? You know, what's the message you've taken uh, from them? And how do you wash what they have to sell from what you really need to buy, right? I mean, everybody's got, you know, you know what you need, Colonel Johnson, and you're like, yeah, well, I'm not sure I need that. Talk to us about both what you want industry to bring you or what you rather want from industry, right? What are you, what are you, what are you interested in? What are the big problems you need solved that you're looking to industry to solve for you? No, and that's or help you with. A absolutely. I'd say one of the big ones, and this is not just myself as fixed wing, but I think a lot of the other organizations within ATNL is data automation. How do I consume and filter and fuse information to decision quality info for a commander, whether it's a commander on an aircraft or a ground force commander? And I think that cross cuts many different type of capabilities. Um, again, reductions in size, weight, and power. How can I get more return on investment for the capabilities that I currently have? And I've been telling industry all week, and, and even the industry partners I've been working with for a long time, is interoperability and crossing those lines of communication between different industry partners. So as we go to a more open architecture, how do we cross proprietary lines and be able to have that collaboration that's more effective so we can, again, increase our pivot speed? At least, if I may, one, one last question. Um, we're in a budgetary environment where we went up very, very rapid. I mean, it's, it's been trending up, but we went up, had a big bump, mm -hmm. going to have another big bump we expect next year, and then flattening, if not declining. Mm -hmm. From the standpoint of somebody who's managing very complex programs that you just can't hide under the, under the carpet, <laughs> right? It's kind of a C-130. It's, it's going to be, you know, you could be like, oh, we're trying to cover it up. Um, you know, how, how are you planning? How are you thinking? Because this is, these are complex programs, they're big, they've got long tails on them. How, what's, what's, what's the technique, what's your thinking on how are you going to manage these programs to ensure that there's going to be a degree of stability to them and not have sort of these big sort of spikes and perturbations that we tend to see that just end up delaying, you know, just unnecessarily costing us money at the end of the day? No, great question. So I think there's a couple of different ways to do that. One, by increasing our speed, if we can get to the end state and field quicker, that that has proven in the past cost avoidance. ACJ, um, AC-130J has been a great example where we increased our rate of production so we were able to save money on the back end. Um, another way that we do that is by leveraging the services. So the more that we can have that service common and work with our service partners, especially the Air Force and the Navy, you, know, you talk about C-130s, we partner very heavily with them. So the more that's service common that we can work together, that obviously reduces our, over, um, our overhead on soft, peculiar soft um, specific capabilities. Um, and again, you know, it's just we need to make sure that um, we're being able to integrate and have interoperability throughout, again, so saving time, which will, of course, save cost down the road. 
Do, do you feel that there's greater delegation of authority now, given all of these acquisition changes? You know, we have a tendency of thinking about it in a big policy level, but from a PO level, do you feel the change? Do you feel more empowered than you did in the past? You know, here I think we're really fortunate that it's part of our culture already. You know, as, as the PEO, I have quite a bit of authority delegated down to me. So I think that the rest of the services are really starting to adopt the culture that we've been living for quite a while. Colonel Melissa Johnson, uh, fixed wing uh, aviation chief uh, or P PEO for fixed wing aviation here at United States Special Operations Command. Thank you so very much. Thank Best of so luck much. on all your programs. Thank you, Vago. Great. Thanks so much.